We've sold $15,000 surfboards when someone just saw a post on Instagram. Hey, my name is Felix T. I'm the host of Shopify Master, the weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn how to talk about your brand at a fair or trade show, how to collaborate with artists to turn their audience into your customers, and how they sold a $15,000 surfboard from a post on Instagram. Tim joined by David Dennis from Ventana Surfboards and Supplies, which sells hollow reclaimed wooden surfboards, body surfing, hand planes, eco apparel, and sustainable surf supplies based out of Santa Cruz, California. Welcome, David. Thank you. Yeah, so you uh, mentioned to us was that most of your products, especially the wooden surfboards, are made from the quote-unquote quote, trash of others, so very unique materials. Where did the idea come from? Well, you know, I, I was uh... – I did a photo exhibit a while back uh, to raise money for the Surfrider Foundation. And while I was photographing surfboard shapers in our area, I realized how toxic the materials were that surfboard shapers were using. Did a little more research, realized that wetsuits are made out of petroleum. Basically, we, we talk a good game as surfers about loving the ocean, uh, but our behavior doesn't match with that. So we decided we wanted to with uh, my partner, Martin Stipout, who makes hollow wooden surfboards. And we, we launched a company together about six years ago to focus on environmental responsibility for surfers. Awesome. So what's your, what's your background? You're, you mentioned that you're a photographer? Well, I do photography exhibits uh, to raise money for nonprofits on the side. Um, my real job is actually at Microsoft. I'm uh, on the Outlook team. Uh, I've done a lot of things for Microsoft over the years. I've been there more than 18 years. So my background is actually in tech and product development. Got it. So you have some experience uh, developing products, but was this the, your first physical product that you worked on? Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay, so you had this uh, this idea, and then how did you find your, your partner to, to work with on this business idea? Well, my partner had been building uh, wooden surfboards for, God, it's going on more than 10 years now. And he had been using reclaimed materials more out of necessity, right? So the cost was a lot lower when he could get materials that were donated or, you know, wood that was reclaimed from say floorboards from the house or something like that. And so it fit with the, the, the responsibility value that we wanted for the company or that I wanted. And so I asked him if he wanted to, you know, restart what he was doing uh, with a, with a slightly new name and uh, with a set of brand values that focused on a high end craftsmanship, environmental and social responsibility and creating products for real surfers out in the world. Got it. So this was already a product that your partner was creating. You wanted to work with him to take it to essentially the next level and take it to the next next stage. And you mentioned a couple of things here, brand values, high-end craftsmanship. What made you decide to recognize that these were kind of value adds that bringing the two of you together could create? Well, so Martine, my partner, is this incredible you know, artisan. The boards that he creates are, are incredible. They're gorgeous. They surf really well. He doesn't have the marketing and sales background and the tech background, and I can can't cut you know a straight line on a on a saw to save my life. So it was just a good partnership. We wanted to expand the brand. We do clothing. We've created some invented some products for surfers. We do artist collaborations. We've done um, you know surfboards, hand planes now for body surfing, uh, and so it was it was a good marriage of my skill set and his skill set. Um, because he really wants to go and create amazing surfboards and, and other wooden products. And and I like to do the sales, marketing, and tech side of things. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great combination that that uh, I've seen succeed over and over again, which is that sales and marketing side uh, partner that is combined with the, the kind of product expert and and the creator of the, the product itself. What what makes a partnership, when you looking look back on the last, you know, five, six years you've been working together, what do you think makes a partnership strong when you want to combine those two kind of forces together? I think it's mutual respect. I've got tremendous respect for the work that he does. I probably his biggest fan, uh, the, the things he's able to do with wood and other materials are just blow my mind. And he's respectful of the skills that I bring to the table that he either isn't good at or doesn't want to learn. And so we, I think we equally value each other's work and respect it. And that, I think, is what's made it work for so long. 
Mm. Okay, so you knew that you both should work together, decided that, hey, let's take this thing to the next stage, next level. What were the first steps? The first steps for us were uh, we created, we, we used sort of a lean startup model, you know, similar to a tech company where we start with a very small run of products. And so what we first did was, was we sat down, we incorporated, we did all the legal things. Um, but then we decided on a very, very small subset of products uh, of the ones that we maybe could create. You know, we thought we could do a huge clothing line and we could do, uh, you know, a whole huge run of surfboards and all sorts of things. But we, we sat down and we said, let's do a limited run of this, 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 and this. And it was a very small number of things. So we had a coffee collaboration and we had some t-shirts and we had some sweatshirts and we had a few other products and a couple of surfboards. And we found a craft fair. Um, a holiday craft fair to attend to test out whether or not people in our local area liked what we created and that it would resonate with them. And so we set up our booth and we sat out in the cold outside and near the beach in Santa Cruz, California at this holiday event. And we were blown away. We did, I think we did almost $10,000 in our first, our first day, um, just in a few hours. And so that was how we knew we had you know the right thing. And we've just been iterating on products ever since. That's, that's amazing. That's certainly enough validation for pretty much anybody to say, hey, let's dive a little bit deeper into this. So 10,000 in the first day. What do you think was, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've kind of iterated over time, the brand, the products and everything. But on that first day, what, what do you think was about you guys or, or the products that made people want to spend this kind of money with you for like a brand new company on the first day? I mean, the, the, the products have to stand on their own. They have to be cool whether or not they have a great story behind them. And so we have you know, cool designs. The surfboards are beautiful. Um, you know, we had really neat local collaborations that, that resonated with people. But I think for all the time we've been doing it, it's the brand values, artisanship, responsibility, adventure. And we just continue to hammer those with every single thing we do, everything we create, whenever we're telling our story, when I'm talking to you today, high end quality products that are good for the environment, that are useful and last in the wild for, for people that are out there doing adventure. And those things just seem to be resonating with people. Plus, they like to be able to meet the people who are designing and making their products. And that local connection that we have to, to our customer base has really been valuable. And now we've been able to expand that you know, globally. We connect with people on the web and through social media and tell that same story. And it, and it works even beyond our local area. Mm. So for anyone out there that wants to take the same approach where they are taking this MVP kind of lean startup model where they just put a product out there, get into these like uh, a fair, like you, like for you guys, a holiday craft fair. What, how do you communicate if that's like your kind of value proposition is the brand values and you want to put that out front? How do you communicate that in like a, a fair kind of environment? When someone comes to, to take a peek at what we're doing, so you have somebody, let's just, and we do the same thing online, but let's just talk about it in the physical world. Somebody walks by you know, a booth that we have set up or um, wanders through and asks us a question about something. We always tell stories. So it's not, hey, can I help you? Or are you looking for something special? It's, have you heard the story of that? And, and that is whatever they're looking at. So if they happen to be looking at a t-shirt, Say, oh, that's made of recycled plastic bottles and organic cotton. Can I tell you the story of the design on the front? And people love hearing stories. So for us, a lot of what we've done in the physical world as well as in the online world have been just storytelling. People will stop and listen for a half an hour sometimes for us to tell the story of all of our products and how they all connect and the amazing backstories of the woods and our surfboards and things like that. So for us, it's just storytelling. Hmm. I, I, I'm not sure if you can distill this down in, into ways to do it, but once, if someone out there ha doesn't have experience you know, telling stories and they haven't thought about this way of marketing where you are just telling stories rather than just talking about your product, I guess what's the difference and how do you make sure that you are actually in storytelling mode rather than, I guess, direct selling mode? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I've when, when I've talked to other entrepreneurs, I always you know, work with them to say, okay, tell me about your products. And then we work on the story. So I think it's different for every single product. But for us, it, it often starts with the surfboards. So somebody will come by and they'll say, wow, that surfboard's gorgeous. Is it hollow? And then that will be the trigger that will allow us to start telling the rest of the story. So yes, it's hollow. We don't use foam. Foam's bad for the environment. 
Um, let me show you this piece of wood. This piece of wood comes from the boat that John Steinbeck sailed into the Sea of Cortez in 1940. And this piece of wood is floorboards from the 1800s. And the design that we have on this board matches this T-shirt over here that's made from responsible materials. Everything we do is environmentally responsible. So we're just constantly trying to create unique products and then connect them all together through a storyline. And I think anybody can do that. If all you're doing is just reselling the same widget that everybody else had, it's harder to do. But figure out a way that you can create a story that goes along even with that. And so sometimes it's as simple as you, know, you donate some of your profits to um, a, a local cause. So you can say, hey, you know, this, is, this product is terrific. Yes, we all know it may be similar to the one down the street, but we donate 5% of our profits to um, women's health issues or something like that. And so sometimes in doing the right thing for the society is also a way to to tell a better story for your brand. Got it. So your story is kind of built into the product from the beginning, but you're saying that you can still create a story around a product, even if it was not necessarily afterthought, but like you haven't gotten a chance to create the story yet. You're saying that with, you can start with any product and still find ways to either create a story using the product as is or institute something into your business like giving things away or uh, like some kind of charitable aspect to generate a story even though it wasn't kind of built from the ground up. Yeah, I mean, it can be a charitable story. It can be, and, and they shouldn't be stories, right? These have to be, you know, I keep saying the word story, but they also have to be authentic, right? You don't want to just donate money to an important cause just just to make a buck. But if it's something you're passionate about and it's something that connects with your brand in a, in a meaningful way, then by all means, tell that story. The story can also be about you as an individual, right? We'd like to tell a story about my partner and I, how we met. We met through a photography exhibit where we were working on giving back money to Surfrider Foundation to, to help the ocean. People have interesting backstories about themselves that connect with other people. And so find whatever that secret sauce is about you, about your products, about the way that you treat others around your giving back that is unique, that can help differentiate you from others. Got it. Okay. I want to talk about the lean startup model that you, you, you're talking about. Uh, for anyone out there that doesn't know it, can you kind of give like a high level overview of what is the lean startup model and particularly how did you apply it towards physical e-commerce products? Yeah, I, I think people can get online and, and look up lean startup and, and go much deeper than I can. But the short version of it is start small and iterate. And so create in the tech world, what we call a minimum viable product. So what's the What's the least amount of effort you need to put into something to create a concept, a product, a piece of software, an app, whatever, that you can get out into the world quickly and validate that you're on the right track and then iterate on that based on what's selling or what feedback you're getting from customers or how people are using your product or what they're telling you about it. And so that's basically what we've done. You know, we, instead of in our first shirt line, instead of creating a thousand of them, assuming they would sell. We created 24 of them and went and saw if they sold. And so start small and don't overextend yourself and then go bigger once you know that what you've created is resonating and working for your customers. Mm. And this, the, idea, the reason why you want to do this is just so that you, you de-risk yourself or it makes you That's more right. agile. Okay. D yeah. You don't, I mean, it's, it's the, the crass reason is because you're going to save money, right? You're not going to put a bunch of money into something that, that doesn't work. The other thing is, mm -hmm. is that you're going to be able to hone what you've created to be exactly what your customers want, right? Like we, I'll give you an example. We did our first shirt was on a cream color um, with a, with a dark ink and people hated it. They just didn't want a light color shirt. And so we went back to the drawing board. We did a bunch of survey work. We, we iterated on a few other designs and a few colors and we've landed on people like dark grays and dark blues. And, had we decided to buy a thousand cream colored t-shirts, we'd still be holding on to them right now. We would have wasted a lot of money and we didn't have a lot of money when we started. Mm. So did you create an MVP for, with the apparel only, or did you also do this with the, I guess the, the more flagship product that the surfboards? Well, so, I mean, to be clear, we're still very, very small. There are only two of us and we're pretty, we're pretty limited in the runs that we do of everything. Um, the surfboards are very exclusive. So those will always be limited. Um, what we've done is we've iterated on features. Um, so we've tried different features of the surfboards and we've, you know, 
kept those in, if they work and if people didn't if they didn't resonate with people you know they might go by the wayside but uh, the surfboards we do maybe 10 maybe 12 a year they're between eight and fifteen thousand dollars each so those are things that are always going to be limited and exclusive when i'm talking about uh, iteration i'm talking about things like our apparel something we invented called the save a surf box we did a mini version of it that didn't sell very well. And then we actually added a bunch of features and people loved it. So things like that, more of the smaller things as opposed to the, the larger ones. In addition, the, the collaborations we do. So we've collaborated with beer companies and wine companies and a knife maker and a coffee maker and a hot chocolate maker and a person who makes belts and salts and soaps. And we've created all these really interesting co-branded products. And the ones that sell, we do more. And the ones that don't, we stop buying. Mm. I feel like this is like a battle a lot of times with entrepreneurs, which is deciding or if they're spending too much time working on something before testing on the market versus spending too little time and it's just not ready at all. How do you decide if something should go in as part of that MVP, that very first release that you're testing out versus something that you guys are going to table and maybe put in a list of a backlog of ideas to test later? I mean, some of it comes down to whether we have the time to do it. Um, some of it comes down to just intuition. And, and it's it's not intuition, I probably. It's really uh, understanding the market, researching what other people are doing, um, what, what we're seeing, you know, people wandering around the streets with, doing surveys with our customers, asking people for feedback on is it this or is it that on, on say, Instagram. Um, and it usually starts though with the spark of an idea that we have, Hey, this would be really cool to work with this artist on this shirt with this color. Uh, or wow, we should really try beanies or something like that. We see a lot of people wandering around with beanies when they're checking the surf breaks. And so, so it'll start with sort of some, some thoughts and some intuition and a little bit of research and kind of eyes open, seeing what's out in the world. Uh, and then we test out products from there. And what's your, I guess, success rate right off the, the bat? Like, do you go into these very first MVP tests in the market knowing that it's probably not going to work at first? Or do you usually find out that it works at first? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we usually launch new products at uh, a big event. So we just did something, for example, called the Capitola Art and Wine Fair. And it's just, it's, there's thousands and thousands of people that come to that. So usually we'll start with a product at a big event. Um, where we can really talk to hundreds of customers and see what's selling and see what they think. And, you know, if it's a co-branded salt, you know, we get them to taste them and see which ones they like best and things like that. So I think our success rate, I, I don't know, uh, it's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to measure success. Some of the time we'll launch a new product and we'll do it just for marketing purposes. We're telling some really interesting story that will attract a bunch of people to our brand, but we don't expect to sell a lot of it. But I'd say probably, I don't know if I had to put a raw number on it, 70% of what we create or what we work on with others um, does fairly well and 30% falls by the wayside. Mm, okay. So you mentioned that you had this, is it called Save the Surf Board or sorry, Box? Uh, sa save a Surf Box. Yeah. Save a Surf Box. And then you also mentioned the the t-shirts that you're, the pair that you're selling at first that was not a hit and required some iterations. Now, when you do face this where you are, well, that didn't work. Let's go back to the drawing board. How do you know what to change this in, in, before retesting? You know, I think it comes back to that intuition again. I, it, 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 But it's intuition based on you know, looking at sales numbers and talking to people. So it, the intuition part comes with, okay, well, they may not have liked this product that we created as much as we thought they would, but they're not necessarily able to tell us exactly what they would want to do differently. We just know they said, well, it seems a little expensive or, you know, that thing seems like it could break easily or something like that. So you say, okay, what do we do next to take this thing to the next level? Because we think there's potential or do we just kill it and move on? And, and that just sometimes comes from discussion. The Save a Surf Box is an interesting one. We, it, it's, a, it's a product that's made from the trash of four different companies. So it's a wooden box that's made with leftovers from um, usually Santa Cruz Guitar Company. They're, they're wooden leftovers and different exotic woods from cabinet shop offcuts. And it's, it's a box to hold your wax, your surf wax, so that your surf wax doesn't melt in the, in the car or when it's out in the sun. But we add a whole bunch of things to it. So we know that when you're surfing, you always need screws for your fins. So we put different types of screws in, embedded into the box. You need a wrench for those. So we have a wrench embedded into the, lamp, into the lid. The lid is also what we call a wax comb and a scraper, which 
is a tool that all surfers need. Uh, we have a leash cord to connect your leash to your surfboard that co comes from the leftovers of a product made by another company called Cords Mugs. We put a bottle opener on that. And we also decided to put a sundial in the lid that, that you create using the wrench. And that's, that's calibrated for, for where we live, but we calibrate those for all over the world. So on that product, the original version of it was just the lid. All it was was a wax comb and a scraper with a leash cord on it. And they were about almost 20 bucks. But you can get something like that for about three dollars, you know, made from China out of plastic. And so when the first version of it sold OK, we went back and said, you know, every surfer needs a tool. But what other problems can we solve that no one else has solved before? And my partner came back with this incredible box that has all these features. It's almost like a Swiss Army knife for surfers. And no one's ever seen anything like it. And that one's now going for $50 each, and we're selling them all over the world you know, with custom engraving and, and custom sundial calibration and things like that. So that one just came down to we knew that we knew that we had uh, – there was a need in the market, and rather than kill the first iteration, we decided to just try something even cooler, and it worked. Mm. Okay, so when you do see that you can make tweaks to to enhance the product, or maybe the first time you put it out there it wasn't successful, but you still feel like there's something there, you go back to the drawing board, figure out what tweaks to make. Now, how do you how do you relaunch? Like, what is the I guess second coming out party like? Yeah, everything we do is on social media. For, for in terms of the stories that we're telling, if you know, obviously when we're doing an event with real people, we can tell the story there. People come up and say, "Oh, what is this thing?" and we can tell the story easily. Um, but most of our initial storytelling and product launches and things like that, and and again, I want to you know reiterate, this is all small scale stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We're it, I think a lot of the lessons work for bigger brands as well. But we're doing, you know, we'll do li very limited runs still of most of our products and. Um, Sometimes we'll try and do pre-sales. Pre-sales can help you determine if you're if you're actually going to have something that's successful or not. I know people use Kickstarter in that way as well. But most of what we do is we tease, we tease, hey, we're creating something new. Here's a sneak peek, and we'll put put it all on social media. And most of our product launch stuff happens there. Got it. So if it's not a hit though, and you're you're do you have issues with explaining to to the audience like, hey, this is different than the first time we've done thing is a little bit differently. How, does that an issue like how to communicate that it is not the same thing as what was launched previously? No, not really. Um, you know, we'll say, hey, you're still using that same cool design, but check out this new color. Uh, people, it, it hasn't been an issue. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So let's talk about this uh, approach that you've taken with uh, social media. You mentioned that you spent a lot of time on there as well, kind of involving the the customers, your audience in the process of building this entire business and the product sales. So tell us about your strategy there. What is it that you like to do on social media to build your following? So again, it's storytelling. So we post or I post because I'm responsible for, for social media as, as well as a number of other things that on uh, almost every day on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, probably weekly on Reddit. Um, Occasionally on YouTube, a bunch of other social networks that people may never have heard of. Anytime there's something new, I always try it out. But uh, we're just trying to tell a story of what we're working on, a board that we might be creating, some new concept that we've thought of, some new shirt design, some new retailer that's selling our products. So every day, it's just a new story, a new story, a new story. And just you know, to, to get more reach, we're usually using a series of hashtags that works to help get Instagram, for example, to for their algorithms to kick in and, and get the, the message spread a little more broadly beyond our followers. The other thing that we do is we do collaborations a lot. And so as an example, we have uh, something we create called a body surfing hand plane, which is almost like a mini surfboard you wear on one hand that helps you body surf. We created uh, 11 blank ones, just wooden ones that had nothing on them. And we promoted on our social media an application process for artists all over the country to apply to put their art, painting, drawing, wood burning, whatever, on, on our hand planes. And we, had, we were just overwhelmed with response. We picked 10, uh, 11 uh, artists. And then they documented the process of creating the art on our hand planes. They put it on their social media. 
we would then repost or post their their work on our social media. And so we had this like network of artists all over the country promoting us while we were promoting them. And we've done lots of different things like that where we get collaborators to promote for us and vice versa. And so again, storytelling and collaborations for us have been huge on social media. Yeah, so you mentioned these collaborations with, with artists. Are, what are they working with you on creating? Yeah, so in this in this in this specific case, uh, we we sent wooden blank hand planes to these artists, and they put their art they drew or painted or wood burned or whatever. One we have an artist doing glass blowing that's going to put, put glass in it, and we had a resin artist do resin work on one. And so they decided they created whatever they wanted that was ocean related, and then mailed them back to us. And my partner created the hand planes. He's the one that's putting the fiberglass on them now. And I'm the one that markets them, tells the stories, and does the sales. So in terms of product development for that kind of product, it's in this case, it was the artists with my partner. Uh, when it comes to things like T-shirts, I'm the one that's working with artists to create the designs and do the contracts and source the, source the, the materials for the, for the clothing and that sort of thing. Um, so it really depends on what the product is. Makes sense. Now, how do you find the the collaborators? Uh, most of what we found is either locally. Um, sometimes we'll meet people at our events, but in large part, it's on it's on social media. So one of the things that I like to do is look for artists that have a huge following, much bigger than ours, and either ask to do a, a collaboration where it's sort of quid pro quo, where you know we promote each other. Or, you know, I might pay an artist to create, say, a new shirt design, and then they'll promote our brand and the new T-shirt and we'll promote their art. And so if I can find a really, really high quality artist that has, say, 200,000, 250,000 followers, it's worth contracting with that person. One, because the art's beautiful, but also because we get more reach for our brand because part of what we contract with them is that they'll promote what we're doing uh, through their channels as well. Got and so the goal, I guess, business wise, the goal is to bring over the audience from that that collaborator that you worked with, and maybe eventually they will also become customers of your company as well by checking out your other products and buying other products. Okay, so mm -hmm. right. So what what is that process like to to let's say you identify a collaborator that you want to work with? Like how long does this? I guess what's involved in going from first reaching out to them and they agreeing to work with you all the way to having a product on your website ready for, for, for purchases. You know, it can take, it doesn't often take that long. I mean, a lot of times I'll find an artist that I just think is amazing. Um, and it'll just popped up in my feed or somebody will have sent it to me or I'll have seen it go viral on YouTube or Reddit or something like that. And I'll just DM the person and usually through Instagram and say, and this is, this is in the, in the example of a shirt, right? There's a, I could talk about the beer, the wine, the other things we've done. Everyone is a little bit different, but in the case of working with artists, I'll just DM them and say, Hey, would you be interested in doing a collaboration? We'd love to have some of your artwork custom created that matches our brand on a new you know, hoodie or a new t-shirt or something like that. And we just iterate back and forth. Sometimes within 48 hours, we can get the terms of an agreement together. And sometimes we'll do a full contract. Sometimes it'll just be um, done over email. And, you know, we, we just agree in, on basic terms, even sometimes over DM on Instagram. Uh, and then we set a time frame and I source all the, the blanks that we're going to need to print on, uh, which I can usually get in a couple of weeks. And sometimes it can go from I found the person on Instagram to new shirt design in six weeks. Wow, that's pretty pretty quick and and straightforward. And I I was thinking that a lot of these artists that you might reach out to might not be you know as serious as you are and ready to go. I I, I was imagining that a lot of people might say that they're interested, they want to do, but then either don't follow through or kind of drag their feet. Like you don't experience that, or like how much kind of pushing do you have to do on your end to to get a collaboration to take off? Yeah, not sometimes. I mean, artists tend to be and this is a, a stereotype and a total overgeneralization, but artists tend to be creative types. They're not necessarily focused on, you know, project management and deadlines and things like that. So occasionally, you know, there'll be a couple day delay here or there. But if I'm reaching out to a very professional artist who's, who's cultivated an incredible community on Instagram, let's say, or on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, um, they're usually pretty driven and pretty professional. And that hasn't been an issue. 
Occasionally, we'll reach out to somebody and they won't get back to us because they're not really paying attention. Occasionally, we'll reach out to somebody and their fee is so ex- exorbitantly high that we can't afford it. But generally speaking, it's a pretty smooth process. That's different. You know, if we're doing, we've done two beers with Humble Sea Brewing Company, a local brewer, and that process is totally different um, because it takes a while to brew beer and then they create a beer label and we then create a t shirt from that label and we iterate on the design for the beer and all that sort of stuff. So sometimes the, it's a little more complicated, but the collaborations are really, really fun and they're usually pretty smooth. Mm, yeah, so you're basically saying if they have a large enough following, they probably aren't, you're probably not the first person to reach out to them. So they probably have some understanding of like how to collaborate or work with someone else. If that makes sense. So what, what's the, what's the pitch to the artist? Like what does the artist typically care the most about? Like what's important to them? A couple things. Sometimes it's tapping into a new audience. So we've got a huge audience of surfers, um, especially in California, but also all over the world. So maybe an artist that wants to create something that's ocean specific that they've never done before to tap into a new, a new market, a new audience in in terms of what we have. Sometimes it's just doing something fun and cool and different that they're, they're really interested in. And sometimes it's, I think uh, partly can be about extra money. You know, we're going to pay the artists usually to do, to do some, some work for us. and, And that may be, a good reason. In the case of the hand planes, the way it worked was we created these blank wooden hand planes. They did the art. We took them back. We now market them and we split revenue with the artist. So it wasn't any money up front, but it, it's a co, co a co-marketing engagement. So the artist is promoting us. We're promoting them. We try and sell their work and then we split money with them. And so for them, it was both a marketing thing and a revenue thing, but it wasn't money that we had to pay up front. It was money that only gets paid to the artist uh, and to us if it sells. Is that the ideal uh, setup for for the business side? I think so. In the case of these kinds of collaborations, absolutely. I think when it comes down to, say, a T-shirt, we found that it's it's difficult to track. There's There's challenges with tracking sales. Because what you, what I found it doesn't work is a cut of revenue for, for say, a, apparel. And that's because sometimes, sometimes we'll sell a bulk, bulk to in wholesale to a retailer. And it sometimes we'll sell our own and we may not be great about tracking inventory sometimes. And so it's really difficult to track like um, a, a revenue on a cut of the sale. Um, the what's easier for us to do is just to pay a flat fee to the artist to use their art for a specific period of time or indefinitely and leave it at that. It requires less kind of management after the agreement is done. Yeah, that's right. I mean, mm-hmm. and I and I do all that kind of stuff. Got it. Okay, so are you looking for collaborators usually like that that have followings on Instagram? Like what's the platform that works the best in terms of working with a collaborator? Yeah, Instagram's best for us. Um Facebook's okay. We've closed a few sales for larger products through Facebook, but for the it 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 kind of blows me away, right? Instagram will sell some of our smaller products that way. Generally, our smaller products do better when we're in person um, at an event or something. But we've sold fifteen thousand dollars surfboards when someone just saw a post on Instagram, and so we've I think we've probably done gosh eighty a hundred thousand dollars in surfboards just over the last couple of years. Um, from people seeing posts on Instagram about our surfboards, which blows me away, right? It's such a high end purchase. It seems to me to be the kind of thing where you'd want to iterate with the, with us and look at what we've got and spend some time talking to us. And, you know, a lot of times it's just, Oh, I want that. And, you know, ship it to me next week. It's, it's wild. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I think you mentioned that by showcasing that surfboard building process through photos, time-lapse videos, and short clips of how you work on Instagram has closed these high ticket sales. What what do you think is the cost of like, why is it that by showing the kind of behind the scenes as led to selling $15,000 surfboards? I, I think people want something that's unique. They love the stories. You know, every piece of wood, every splinter has a really interesting story behind it that's totally unique, given that everything's reclaimed from interesting sources. And I think people are longing, you know, in a world where you've just got mass manufactured products that don't have a soul, people are are longing to know where their products came from, to know a little bit about the person who created them. 
in our case, sometimes we'll have people fly out and actually be a part of the building process. They want to get their hands dirty. They want to feel the wood. They want to put the resin on the board. They want to know where this product came from and to it in a way that's not possible if you just, you know, buy a widget on Amazon. Mm. Now, okay, so you mentioned a couple other platforms, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook. Do you change the type of content that you post on, on these platforms? Like, how do you decide which, what goes where? It, it's, it's less about changing the content and it's more about um, tweaking the message a little bit. So as an example, um, we posted, uh, I think yesterday, a, a video of a kid a teenager helping build a surfboard with us that was given as a surprise to his father uh, at his father's wedding by, by his new wife and the, the son helped you know build the board. And so we created a video and a bunch of photos around that whole process. But what I did was I posted a video of the, of the, the kid and his name was Alessi um, putting resin on the surfboard for his father and then told that story and tagged all the people, you know, all the sources of the wood and, and talked about the wedding and talked about the surprise and talked about how he was helping with this amazing board and then just tailored the message for each platform. So on Facebook, you know, I'll I'll rewrite the post so that I'm able to tag people correctly, not just have it populate directly from Instagram and have all the, you know, all the tags break and things like that. Um, sometimes I'll create a little, um, you know, a shorter post on Facebook potentially with just a link, a, a URL that goes straight to the web page that explains the surfboard in more detail because you can't put URLs in an Instagram post. Twitter, obviously, I'll get it down to a short, pithy message that's 280 characters or less. Uh, and then on YouTube, if I'm posting there, I'll usually just let the video speak for itself with a very small description because that's mostly a visual medium. So. It's it's not about changing the, the the media asset as much as it's about changing sort of the, the tweaking the message that so that it works correctly on the platform mm-hmm. in question. Got it. So the story is always the same, but you just have to customize the post or the video, whatever it is, to match the restrictions of the platform in different cases. Okay. Yep. Hey, real quick, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know what you think or what you'd like to hear more of. Now, let's get back to the interview. So you mentioned that how you kick this off first with a pop-up event, but that it sounds like you still do these pop-up events today to, to sell products in uh-huh. person. Yeah, we do. The surfboard sales are going pretty well. And so we don't have quite as much time. My partner and I do the events together and he's heads down just building surfboards right now and other, other products that have been custom ordered, surfboard fins, things like that. But we usually do four or five events a year. Uh, and we've been also creating our own events. So we'll put on a huge craft fair of environmentally responsible artisans from California and we'll find a venue and we'll, you know, I'll go out and find all the different artists and artisans that I want. Um, we'll have an application process. There's a small fee. There's a percentage of sales that gets donated back to us, um, for the marketing effort and for paying for the venue and that sort of thing. So Sometimes we'll just tack on to somebody else's event and sometimes we'll create our own event, which frankly is also a source of revenue for us because we're then taking a cut of, of everybody's sales. I like that. Having your own event that you put together. What have you learned about throughout this process? Because this sounds like a, it's almost like its own business that you have to, to run That's right. events. So what's the, what are some, some of the challenges of putting on your own event? There's a lot of logistics. Um, we usually will partner with with another company uh, to do the event so that we can share some of the responsibilities. But if there's going to be alcohol, there's licensing for that. You've got to think about waste disposal, but we always try to have zero waste events where everything can be recycled or composted. So you've got to think about making sure that your simple things like just how who's going to be there to make sure the trash gets separated. Um, we've got coordinating timelines when people can set up I mean, little, little, every little detail. And that's why we don't do them that often because there's so much work to do. You know, if you've got 30 vendors, what order are they going to show up in so that they're not all you know driving in at the same time and stepping on each other's toes and things like that. Um, we try and do, if we're going to have food, we try and time it such that there's a lunch rush and a dinner rush so that the food vendors can make sure that they maximize their revenue, which helps us maximize our revenue. And there's lots and lots and lots of details. So 
generally it's just easier for us to to kind of glom onto somebody else's event but sometimes we'll do one on our own especially if we want to be very very uh, focused on picking just the right vendors that we think are new and unique and that fit with our brand values yeah i was going to ask that next like what is the application process like how do you what kind of questions are you asking to get the right vendors in uh, the basic ones, name, Instagram account, that kind of stuff. And we will go back and look and, you know, how well are they marketing their own business? Because that's part of what we want is that these companies are out there promoting on social media and things like that. How big is their email list? Things like that. Um, we, we also ask questions about their brand values. You know, what is your commitment to environmental responsibility? Explain that. Can you commit at this event to not using any single use plastics, things like that? So when we're doing our own event, we're much more controlling in terms of who we select relative to the degree to which they match our brand values. Mm. Now, how do you market the event to to get vendors to start applying? Uh, a lot of times we'll just start promoting it on on social media and on our email list and we'll ask people to spread the word. So tag a vendor who you think would make sense. Uh, so a, a lot of a lot of it, we have our user base spread virally the the message, and then a lot of time I'll I'll find vendors who I think are a fit, and I'll reach out to them on email or on Instagram mm-hmm. or on Facebook, and say, hey, we think you'd be a great fit for this event. Can you apply? Well, what's the kind of breakdown between the these inbounds that come in and apply themselves versus ones that you actively reach out to? I think the last event we did like this, it was probably. Probably 60% was me and 40% was them finding us. I can imagine when you first start, it's probably like 99% you hustling to get vendors. For anyone out there that's trying to do this from scratch, that is, versus people finding out about you. So when you, so in, in that case, when you are spending your time kind of pitching vendors, what do they care about? Uh, they care about reaching a new audience and making sure that the audience that's going to be attending is big enough and is the right kind of audience for the products they sell. Mm. So, so when, you, when you're doing this for the first time, in your case, when you did it for the first time, anyone out there that's also doing it for the first time, when you don't have any kind of track record yet, what's the, I guess, how do you solve this chicken egg problem where they want to know about who's going to show up and you're like, well, I've never done this before. How, how do you kind of reconcile that? You just be you're just honest. You say, here's all the things that we're going to do to promote it. And we're hoping for this many people, but we're not sure. And there's certainly a risk if you come that it's going to be a big flop. Uh, But here's why we think it won't be. And we'd love you to be a part of the journey with us. And if they say, sure, we'll try it. No risk. You know, it's fine. It'd be at a minimum, we'll get to come to the beach and hang out for a, for a few hours. That's great. Sometimes they'll say, sorry, it's not worth the risk, but we're just super mm-hmm. honest and transparent with people. Makes sense. Now, now what is, let's talk about the other side of it. How do you market the event to the, to the event goers uh, itself? Wow. A lot, a lot of press outreach, a lot of, uh, we pay for promotion. I, I don't use Facebook advertising that much, but we do when it comes to event promotion. Um, we will pay for sponsored posts uh, and sponsored promotions on Facebook um, and a bit on Instagram to promote the event in to the right audience in the right geography. So usually within 50 miles of where we live, if it's a physical event in Santa Cruz. Um, a lot, we've got a pretty good email list. We'll send out the email list. We'll post it on all the public event calendars and the newspaper event calendars in the Monterey Bay area and the San Jose Bay area. Uh, so just a lot of outreach. We usually try to have a few interesting stories that go along with it that we'll reach out to with, uh, the press with press releases or short emails. Uh, we did the first zero waste event in Santa Cruz County, for example. And so we reached out to the press about that. And that was the storyline they went with when they wrote about it, things like that. Mm-hmm. So for your first time event or for anyone out there that is looking to throw on, put on their first time event, how much time do you think you need to to do it successfully without, I guess, pulling out your hair and like stressing out about it? Uh I, I, I wish I tracked my hours, but you're probably looking at, I would say, 100 hours worth of work. Um, and probably you want to start maybe three months in advance. Um, that's probably a good rule. I, I don't know. It, it's it's a lot of work, but it's a labor of love. So I don't I don't think of it sometimes as work because it's fun. I'm getting to meet new people and, you know, meet new artists and new vendors and uh, learn something new about marketing 
and meeting new people in the press that I can tap into later. So I, I always think of it as kind of fun, but uh, mm-hmm. I know for some people it may be stressful. Right. Not to, it's stressful for me too, but I find it a fun kind of stress. <laughs> Got it. But sometimes, you know, we, we've started small. So when we first did this, we, and this is an interesting tip for people, uh, especially for those that are selling online that don't have brick and mortar. We've rented spaces that were vacant in high traffic, foot traffic areas. So in our downtown, um, there, there are always, you know, a couple of vacant retail spaces that may be between leases or something like that. So we did, we did one event where we rented a brick and mortar for three day weekend. And then we subleased a uh, booth space inside that, that store to three or four other vendors that were local and friends of ours. And so we were able to split the cost of the rental for the weekend. And we put on this huge craft sale event. And then we had a huge night party where we released a beer with Humble Sea Brewing Company, the brewing company I talked about, hired a band, had a big Saturday night event for, for the, the, the middle of the weekend. Um, so we started small where we just rented a brick and mortar space from a local landlord. We had a few other vendors and we had a big night party. Uh, and we knew that that's that was, again, back to the minimum viable product. That was sort of the minimum viable product of an event that we put on and we realized that we could do it. And so then the next one we did was much bigger. And you, you said that this was, you're basically renting very prime real estate for probably cheaper, like for a discount since they're in between leases or just, just vacant. Yeah, I think that one was 500. So this is an interesting story. This one, I think was $500 a day. They charge us $1,500 for a weekend which is a little expensive. But then when we had the other vendors join us, they each paid, I think, 250 to us. So that offset the cost to us. We took the bulk of it. We also took the bulk of the square footage, but, uh, but that was in a way to share, to share in the, in the cost. But then the owner of the building came to the party that we threw and fell in love with one of our surfboards that was, I think a little over $8,000 and bought it. So for That's us, hilarious. it wound up being, it wound up being <laughs> super lucrative. Uh, not to mention the fact that we it w- was very successful. We did make a bunch of money, and we had hundreds of people come to this night party with the with the band and and the the Ventana beer we created with Humble Sea sold out in you know in a few hours, and they did really well from a revenue perspective. And so it's just a great event for everybody. That's awesome. So when you look back on your own events uh, that you've run so far, what do you think is the single most important thing to get right about an event? I think it's, I think it's getting the right vendors and making sure that you're marketing it correctly and broadly. I, a lot of people realize, think that they've created something really cool and everyone's just going to flock to it. But what they don't see is just all of the legwork that has to happen to get the word out about a new product, about an event, about something new that you're working on, a new store opening, whatever. There's so much that has to go on around just marketing it online constantly all day long, telling the story. You know, we create a Facebook event early and every couple of days we're posting some new thing. God, got this great new vendor. Or this vendor is going to unveil this cool new product or we've created this new surfboard. Check out some of the work in progress videos. We're just constantly telling the story over and over and over of everything we're doing. And in the case of an event, it's everything leading up to that event. And so it's just it's just constant storytelling until until the day of. And then when you're there, we're constantly telling stories too. Look at this cool vendor come out, you know, here's a, a we're doing a story on Instagram of all these cool people that are here and just, just iterating on the story over and over and over until it just sinks into everybody mm-hmm. that we want to be there. Also, it sounds like you, once the event is over, it sounds like, well, let's, that's done. Let's move on. You're like using the stories that come out of that, maybe the photos and videos yes. that come out of it. You're, you're extending the event past the actual, you know, I guess the runtime of the event. Yeah. And we always, we always donate um, at least 5% of profits to uh, a local ocean conservation group. So we use that as a way to get people to come because they feel like they're doing something good and they are. But then we also talk after the event about how much money we raised and where that money is going to go and the great work that the nonprofit's doing. And so, yeah, we do extend that story in a bunch of interesting ways. Got it. So I want to talk about some of the the talks that you've given, particularly the one around uh, how to build a business focused on sustainability. For anyone out there that is on this path already or are or is thinking about starting a business that's focused on sustainability, what would you say is that the, what do they have to look forward to? Like, What is like the the most rewarding part about this so far for you? 
for us, um, and we may be unique in some ways, but for us, it's building products out of other people's trash and doing in a way that we create things that are higher quality and, and better in, in a lot of ways than anything you could get from new materials. And so, for example, our surfboards, our hand planes, um, a few of the other things we've created, some of the surfboard fins we've done, um, often use redwood as, as one of the elements. And we get old growth redwood that's been salvaged from different places. So we have redwood floorboards from the 1800s, for example. And that's an old growth, clear grain redwood that you can't harvest anymore. You're not allowed to to rip down old growth redwood anymore. And it's, it's incredibly beautiful wood. That's very, very high quality that you can't actually get new. You can't buy it. So we get it all donated to us and we're able to get some, in that case, some of the best material in the world for free. Um, that's better than anything you could get new. So we're always challenging ourselves to find really, really interesting materials and not just wood. We use recycled material in a lot of different things. Um, that's better than what you could buy new that has a better story behind it and that's higher quality. And so for us, it's been, and sustainability has been really, really good for the business, both because it's the right thing to do. People love it from a story perspective, but also it, it's helped us get some of the best materials in the world. Makes sense. Now, what about on the other end of it? Like what challenges would you warn anyone out there that is looking to, to build a business around sustainability? What do they have to look out for? Um, greenwashing. And greenwashing is when you, you're, you're telling people you're doing the right thing for the environment, but the reality is you're not. And we, you see that a lot. You know, people say some big corporation will say, you know, oh, this is, you know, recycled material. And then you look at it and it's, you know, 2% recycled. And, you know, they, they're, they're tapping into this trend around sustainability for the bottom line, when in reality, they're not doing much. And we're guilty of that too, in some ways, right? We, we have shirts that are made from, like I said earlier, recycled plastic bottles and organic cotton. But you can't get good fabrics in the United States. So these are manu the shirts are manufactured for us in the United States, but they're the fabric itself is made overseas. And there's a lot of concern right now about uh, polyester, which is recycled plastic bottles. They basically make them and make it into polyester. The polyester sheds fibers into the water, which ultimately winds up as microplastics in the ocean. And so we're honest about the fact that there's a concern there. And we're now thinking about may maybe moving, even though people love the story of the recycled bottles, we're thinking about moving away from that and going 100% organic cotton because we're concerned about the environmental impact. So nothing you can do is perfect. And you should just be honest about that. But we're always trying to push ourselves and encourage others to push themselves to be as sustainable as possible and to give back money to conservation organizations that are, you know, helping with climate change or with ocean conservation. Mm, yeah, that sounds like as long as you're upfront and honest about it, it sounds like it's the kind of best path forward that works, you know, works for you. And I think will can work for a lot of people. Now, in terms of running the business itself, like what are some of the apps or tools or services or resources that you you and the business relies on to keep it running? Shopify is huge. Um, that's the core of everything we do. Our blog, our website, our e-commerce, our point of sale at events. Um, I recommend that to, I can't tell you how many people I've told to use Shopify. It's, it's for us, it's just been absolutely phenomenal. And it's easy. I have some tech background, but even for people who don't, it's really, really easy to use. Um, and it's pretty, um, we, you know, our, the template we got was fairly inexpensive. I think it was like $70 and, and we've got a pretty nice looking website that's very easy to manage. And I manage it remotely too. Like I can take pictures of a surfboard on my mobile phone, create the product, upload the photos and, and have a product ready for sale as we're photographing it on the beach or something like that. So it's, it's Shopify has been the core for us. Uh, and social media, uh, I mean, I've talked a lot about Instagram and Facebook, a little bit about Twitter, Reddit, uh, YouTube. Those have been critical for our business as well. Uh, and then some of the small business backend tools, um, QuickBooks, for example, um, has been really important for us. Uh, ShipStation, SurveyMonkey, tools like that. Awesome. So I'll leave you this last question. What, what would you say has happened this year for you to consider the year a success? I think for this year, uh, ending this year again, uh, profitable. Uh, I don't actually t do this for money. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned that earlier. I Like I said earlier, uh, I think I told you I work at Microsoft and that's my day job. Um, so I do this for fun. My business partner does it 100% of the time. 
Um, this is how he makes his living. So I think ending the year again profitably uh, and creating probably at least 12 custom wooden surfboards for high-end customers I think would be great. Uh, and we'd love to do a few more collaborations with artists on some of our apparel and maybe some of our hand plane products as well. I think that would be a successful year for us. Awesome. So VentanaSurfboards.com, V-E-N-T-A-N-A Surfboards.com. Thank you so much for your time, David. Felix, thanks a ton for talking. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. Shopify.